Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and today I'm here to answer some of your questions that you've posted um, on, um, on the videos and as well as the Gmails that you've been, uh, the emails that you've been sending me. Um, I really appreciate all of your messages and all of your kind words. Uh, it's my goal today to answer as many questions as quickly as possible uh, so I can refer other people who ask the same questions to this video. Uh, first question that's pretty common is uh, how long have you been playing? Uh, I've been playing since I was around eight years old, which is uh, makes that uh, well well over 40 years I've been playing. Um, so yeah, from uh, from a little kid, uh, I started getting serious in my high school years about music, and I was already gigging when I was like 13, you know, playing wedding band and. A lot of rock bands and stuff like that, and some jazz groups. So I've been playing a very long time. Uh, next common question, uh, who did you study with? Uh, well, I've had a lot of teachers. Um, my first real percussion teacher was a guy named Jack Winters. That was in Plainfield, New Jersey. Jack has passed away, but he's a great teacher. Introduced me to uh, uh, all, of the, all of the percussion instruments, hand drums, and you know, mallet instruments, and um, uh, we listened to tons of music together. He was interested in a lot of music from, um, you know, Cuba and Brazil and, and Africa, and just, uh, it, was, it was a great education working with, with Jack. Um, he also taught me piano. We started uh, jazz piano, which was great. And then my next formidable drum teacher was Joe Morello who I studied with uh, in my high school years, all the way uh, sporadically through college. Um, and I met Joe on a gig. I used to play with this big band. It was called the Joe Carson Big Band from 13 till around 17, I think. That's what, how old I was. And uh, Joe was a member of the club, and he would came up and would sit in, and we became friendly. He was always super cool with me. and. You know, he asked me to come out, and we would hang out and, and play, and then I kind of started studying with him, sort of informally. Um, and I used to be his last student. My mom used to take me all the way down. It was in West Orange, New Jersey. I think it was like maybe Glenn Weber Studio, I think. And um, yeah, and then after lessons, we would go out uh, to a nearby bar, and I would drink Coke, and we would just talk. He'd have his dog there. It was, it was pretty awesome. So. Uh, I loved working with Joe. We didn't play drum set. We used to just do double drum set at the end of the lesson. We just played duets. We didn't study drum set. We studied technique, just hands. That's it. Uh, and that was great for me because I was super into that and that's what I wanted. So. Uh, and then while I was in college, I studied with a great timpanist, uh, orchestral percussionist named Fred Hinger. Uh, he's pretty, pretty legendary. He was the timpanist for the Philadelphia Orchestra under Eugene Ormandy uh, and Stokowski for a long time. And then he worked with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra for a long time. Uh, so I was very fortunate. When I studied with him, it was at the tail end of the Met, and then he was retiring. So <clears throat> he was um, pretty, pretty mellow with me. I've heard other stories, but uh, always very kind to me. And I used to take lessons at his house in Leonia, Leonia New Jersey. So I got to play on calf timpani heads, which really influenced my love of calf heads. That and watching Mel Lewis at the Village Vanguard growing up really made me fall in love with the sound of calf heads. So I, I always have a kit with calf heads to this day. Uh, so I studied with him. I studied a little with Walter Rosenberger. Uh, he was the uh, he was in Manhattan too, where I went to school, Manhattan School of Music. And he was the uh, a percussionist with the New York Philharmonic at the time. So between uh, Dan Hinger and, um, and Walter Rosenberger, uh, and Ruth Kahn at Eastman when I was in high school, I had a pretty good foundation for classical percussion as well. Um, and also at Manhattan, I got to study with uh, some great um, arrangers like Bob Mincer and uh, uh, Rich, Rich DeRosa. I took some drum, actually Richie DeRosa is a great drummer, a lot of people don't know that I played with Jerry Mulligan back then, but I uh, took some drum lessons from him and also improv lessons from him. Um, and he was uh, actually Richie DeRosa, John Riley, Todd Kuhlman, Anders Paulson, a bunch of other guys were doing their masters there. They were much older 
they had gone back to school uh, just so they could, I guess, make more money teaching at a college, getting their master's. So I was there at a great time. I was 17 years old. And <clears throat> all these guys were playing in the music, uh, Manhattan School of Music jazz program, which had just started. So that was great for me uh, to, to see that. So yeah, those were my informal teachers, just watching them and uh, hanging out with them and all that. So uh, that, those were my teachers. Um, did you go to music school? Well, I just said that, of course, I went to Manhattan School of Music, uh, just uh, undergrad, and uh, it was amazing for me. Right place, right time. So played a lot of um, uh, new music. Uh, you know, there was people, John Cage was around, and Charles Wernin, and um, uh, Pierre Boulez conducted, he was, he was there, and just all these icons of music were there, and I don't know, I think I should have appreciated it more, but, but now I do, and uh, so I, were, I got to see, and, and uh, Elliot Carter was, was there, and I got to see, with, uh, uh, see a lot of really amazing musicians. Um, can you do a video, oh, oh, these I've already done, uh, so the next three, can you do a video on old K's, I just put that up. Can you do a video on playing fast jazz? I just put that up. Can you do a video on odd uh, time playing? I just did that uh, 10 minutes ago, and that will be up later today. Can you do a video? Oh, can you record the entire Charles Wilcoxon book? I've gotten that from a lot of people. I find that very funny and flattering that I will be able to do something like that. Uh, but I will do it. I'll do it for you. Um, I already recorded all the Pratt books, and I did, I did those because I love them so much, and I also love the Wilcoxon book. Uh, the Pratt books I, I was super familiar with because I played them my whole childhood, and they're very easy for me to record. In fact, I recorded all three of them in maybe two days, uh, you know, so I knocked those out quick. Uh, and they were for students at the time, so they're, you know, a little bit uh, rough around the edges. but. Uh, so I have recorded some Wilcoxon solos for students, and I believe I put those on YouTube. But I'll go ahead and do some more as time permits. So I'll do that. Uh, do you play marimba? Yes, I play a lot of marimba and xylophone and glock and all the metal instruments, vibes, a lot of vibes. And uh, if you want to hear me do that, you can go on Tap Space, search my name, listen to any composition, percussion ensemble composition, and that's me playing. I, when I do my percussion ensemble pieces, I play all the parts in the studio, I overdub them, uh, and then that's how we do it. I don't do any sequencing, but I always play all my music live. I record it myself. It's very helpful. I see where all the problems are, or if, the, uh, you know, I, I can mallet choices, stickings, all that stuff. So, uh, so yeah, if you want to hear me play all the mallet instruments, just go on Tap Space. Uh, and anything you hear like that on YouTube, that's me playing mallets as well. Uh, maybe I should do some mallet videos. They're a little harder to do because the marimba is a big instrument and my camera's not great, as you probably can tell. So we'll see what we can do about that. Um, who are your favorite drummers? Well, that's a, um, that's a big one. I'll probably spend a whole video on that. But I have like probably a hundred favorite drummers. Uh, and it's always changing because there's so many great drummers now. But when I was growing up, I, of course, listened to... Uh, you know, Buddy Rich, it's like everybody was always amazed at, at that circus, uh, and just incredible. I got to see him, and he actually dated my aunt when uh, they were young. My aunt always told me and told me stories about him. I always thought that was pretty neat, so I felt like even though I only met him once, I had some sort of connection with him. But uh, he, uh, he was amazing live. I don't know if a lot of you have gotten to see him live. Videos are one thing. You see him live, it's kind of a just pretty much ridiculous. So uh, I got to see Buddy live probably a dozen times. Um, and so uh, I loved his technique and all that and, and just incredible. Um, but yeah, I was a big fan of, of, of uh, kind of 50s jazz. So I listened to lots of Philly Joe Jones and Joe Jones, older stuff. Uh, a lot of the big band stuff, you know, bassy stuff. And, um, just really all the big band drummers I loved when I was young. And of course, as I got older, I started listening to a lot of the bop drummers. Uh, you know, Roy Haynes, Elvin Jones, Jack D. Jeanette. Um, those are, I love those guys. They're incredible. Um, some of my favorite players to this day just to listen to for inspiration. 
just like everybody else, you know, Tony Williams, everybody. Um, and then modern, so many modern players, Jeff Watts. I've gotten actually, I've been able to do some recordings with him, uh, which has been great to get to see him play up close. And uh, there's just so many, uh, you know, Horatio Hernandez, and I love Dave Weckl, and, uh, you know, all the guys. Steve Gadd, obviously, uh, everybody's favorite from those days. There's so many, too many to list. I love, I love rock. I, I loved I loved Ringo Starr, and I, I love, um, obviously, John Bonham and all, all those guys from uh, Ginger Baker and uh, Bill Bruford. I love Bill Bruford. Um, so, you know, it's endless, really. Uh, I, could, I could sit here all day and name guys when I was growing up that I listened to and still listen to. So listen to everybody you can, every genre you can. That's my advice for you with that. Uh, what is that pad you use? Okay, a lot of questions on that. All I, I, it's an old... Um, uh, practice pads called a drum mute. Uh, I think Henry Adler invented it back in the 60s and then it was bought, patent was bought by a guy in New Jersey, all the parts and stuff. He made them for a while and then my buddy Barry at Drummer's World carried them and I would buy them from him and give them to students and stuff and then uh, Sabian bought the patent and kind of ruined that thing uh, so they were pretty bad for a while. Actually, the uh, last couple of years, I think they've gotten better. It's not the same as the original parts, but they definitely put in some effort, so I'm glad about that. And it's called a drum mute. I guess just now it's a Sabian drum mute. Um, I haven't really bought a new one, but many of my students at the college have them. Uh, it's a great pet because you can play brushes on it. Um, you know, it's a real drum head. I don't like playing on any kind of rubber surface and, you know, all that pillow stuff. I never did any of that. Play on a drum, something with a drum head, because that's what you're going to be performing on. So that's my advice. But those pads are great because, um, you know, a lot of my videos are recorded late at night uh, because I don't have any other time during the day. And, you know, I don't feel like listening to a loud drum, so I'll just play the pad. And also I can have a click track on and hear that. And, you know, I have a lot of snare drum videos on snare drums, several snare drums on YouTube. So if you want to hear me play on a snare drum, just uh, look at those, you know, 50 or so videos on there of me playing. You know, my book Broad Strokes, all those books, those are on snare drum. So, uh, why don't you play, oh, well, let's see, this next question. Why don't you play on a real snare drum? Well, I do, but I play on the pad a lot of times just because um, of the reasons I just said. What sticks do you use? Okay, I get this a lot. Uh, the stick I use for drum set uh, is a stick that Vic Firth has been making me for over 30 years. It's kind of a combination of an SD9 and a Bolero. Uh, a few little modifications, it's a little bit longer, um, but we designed that together and it was basically for playing um, on these on these old K Zildjian's. I want something with a lot of definition and weight and so I love this stick, but I also use lots of other sticks, whatever uh, I need to use, you know, whatever I feel like using, so there's not one stick. This is the one I use the most for drum set. And for snare drum, I use uh, several different sticks. I use a stick that I, I mean, this is a classical snare drum now. I use a, a stick that I make uh, myself. If you want to see those, you can go online and look, search under Rick Dior drumsticks. Um, I haven't made, I'm pretty sold out right now and I haven't made any for a while. I've been too busy, but I got some wood drawing. I'll start up again, but Drummer's World used to sell them. And there's a heavier stick. It's great for practicing uh, and it's great for orchestral snare drum where you need a big, beefy sound like on a field drum and, and like Shostakovich, heavy, heavy stuff like that. So uh, that's what I use. And I also use old sticks by um, Reamer. Um, I think Andy Reamer's making them now, but um, the original ones, William Reamer, are incredible. And I have enough of those I bought to last me forever, I hope. And those were the greatest drum sticks I think ever made for classical percussion. Uh, but just plenty of others, you know, there's the freer sticks and all kinds of drumsticks out now. I'm sure you can find something you like. Um, so, yeah, those are the sticks I use. Can you play match grip? Of course I can play match grip. I do it a lot. Uh, I didn't start match grip until I was in high school, because back then if you played match grip jazz, you were considered a savage, which makes no sense. Uh, but now there's so many great jazz drummers who play match grip that no one ever talks about it anymore. But back then, everybody played traditional. Uh, and I grew up playing that way, so I'm very comfortable playing traditional. But yes, I play lots of match group. I play timpani, and I play um, 
all the mallet stuff is match grip. I play a lot of snare drum match grip and drum set rock and roll match grip. So highly recommend you learn both grips. Super important. And you need to be able to play just as well with either one of them. And then whatever you're comfortable with, uh, do that. I do recommend learning uh, brushes, traditional grip. It's just, it's easier with the weak hand. So you may want to do that. Where can I buy your books? Well, uh, a lot of my books are published by uh, Tapspace um, and Composition, so you can go on there. My drum set book, Advanced Coordination for the uh, Drum Set and, and Percussion, Hand Percussion, is available for me. That I'm sometimes sold out of those because I end up selling them fast. So uh, you just have to contact me. I'll let you know if I have any. It comes with a CD with all the... Um, the whole book's recorded. Also, it has, I have a DVD and a Blu-ray, a video of the whole book. Some of that's posted on YouTube. So if you want that, you get that from me, uh, rickdior at gmail.com. And then also, um, the Three Camps book that so many of you uh, use, um, that is also just available for me. So, uh, Do you make money from YouTube? That's a, a common question, believe it or not. Uh, no, I don't make any money from YouTube because I don't advertise on YouTube. Probably notice there's no ads ever on my videos. Uh, I hate that. Um, it's nothing worse than wa wa wanting to watch something inspirational and have some loud movie trailer or car commercial or political ad or something come up just to ruin your, your vibe, you know. So I will never, ever advertise like that on YouTube. Um, I just don't need to do it and I don't uh, want to do it for that reason. Okay, uh, do you teach lessons? Yes, I teach lessons. Uh, pretty busy, like I said, but I teach at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. Uh, I keep a studio there um, and I'm, um, you know, I've been there about 20, almost 20 years. Uh, so I got some great students there and you can audition there if you want to get a music degree. I do teach privately one day or two days a week, usually on weekends, if you're around the uh, Charlotte, North Carolina area. And I just started teaching Skype lessons. Uh, the only thing is if you're from a foreign country, uh, you're going to need to have an interpreter on hand because I only speak English. I speak a little bit of Spanish and I know some bad words in Italian, but that's pretty much it. So if you want to Skype lesson, we can do that, but you'll need to have an interpreter. So we're not just doing that. Uh, and, but yeah, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, again, you can email me at rickdior at gmail.com if you want to do that. Uh, okay, why don't you post more videos? Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of videos on there, I think, uh, over several years. I think maybe the question is, I might have uh, written this down wrong from the, um, gmail, the, the emails. Why don't I post more often? Yeah, so I think the last time I, sometimes I wait a couple years before I post because I'm just so busy. I mean, I have a family and I got like four different music gigs. You know, I got the symphony, I got the studio, I got the college, I teach privately. You know, uh, whatever, I, I play gig, lots of gigs and all that stuff. So there's not a lot of time to do this kind of thing. Usually when I do it, I'm just, somebody will ask me if I'll do a video, a student or something, or I'll just be inspired to just sit down and play. and I. Turn the camera on and just go. That's why it's very basic. One one camera, one microphone, uh, and just throw it up there, you know. And it, what you see is what you get. I'm not doing any editing. I'm not doing any production. And, and that's the way it's going to pretty much stay until I retire, if ever. Um, another one, why don't you respond to my comments and questions? I got that from a lot of people. I don't know. I don't think it was meant in a malicious manner, but uh, I just don't have time, you know, to, to respond. I've tried to do it more. Um, you know, I got a lot of videos on there, and then a lot of times it's hard to get to everything. Uh, you know, if you email me, I'll probably return your email. Um, so that's probably the best thing. Uh, uh, if you leave comments on there, which I love when you guys leave comments, it makes me feel great and feel like I'm doing something worthwhile uh, with these videos. But, uh, you know, sometimes I won't always answer your questions on there. I'll make a better effort to do it. I'll, I'll try to, to do that. But, um, but that's why. It's just, just time, finding time to do it. Okay, why don't you use more cameras and angles? I guess that means um, more cameras at different angles. I just answered that uh, because I do these things very quickly. I'm in a recording studio. 
it's really busy and I got to set up the drums and the camera somewhere where we can see everything and then I got to tear it back down again to do a session so it's not like I can leave it up for a day or two I got to do it boom like that within a couple hours so that's why if uh, I, I, I spent the last six years building another house that's kind of my hobby I I build houses or, or redo houses so I'm gonna set up a movie studio there at the new house uh, where I have like three or four cameras that might take a few years but my hope is that like when I'm semi retired I can just do videos all day and uh, enjoy enjoy that so so yeah that you know if you can bear with me for 10 years or so then you'll get it and the last one which I think is hilarious is why do you say mmm so much or um so much on the videos well that's because when I make the videos I'm usually really tired and it's super late at night and uh, I just did it again why do you say oh so much uh, I'm, I'm searching for words so it's a defect in my speaking manner and I've heard it from a lot of people I don't do a ton of public speaking although I used to do drum, drum clinics and I'm sure I was doing those and I was much worse because I was probably nervous so uh, I don't get nervous anymore playing. That's another question I get. But I used to get really nervous when I was young, and I would just stammer. So now, you know, whatever. I don't really care. So, so uh, that, but I might say um when I'm searching for the right word or term. So sorry about that, but I'm not going to stop doing it. So that's all the questions for now. And I'm trying to keep this brief, and I'll keep answering your questions. And if you have um, suggestions about videos you want me to do, I'd be glad to take them under consideration. You know, I enjoy doing it when I have time and I really appreciate all your nice comments and uh, I hope I'm helping you in some way. So take care.